Hi, I'm Gail Sokol. And on today's show, we'll be talking about my biggest baking mistakes and how they made me a better baker. Welcome to Baking Radio. Learn the art and science of baking with author, educator, and award-winning chef, Gail Sokol. Whether you've been baking your whole life or you're brand new to the world of baking and you're looking to build your confidence and learn new skills in the kitchen, you're in the right place. This is Baking Radio. On today's show, I want to talk about a few of my biggest baking mistakes, what I learned from each, and how they made me a better baker. So being imperfect is a good thing. Everyone's human, right? It makes you learn from your mistakes, and that is what I have always taught my students. First of all, no one is perfect, and I keep saying it, no one, even trained chefs and famous celebrity chefs, no one is perfect, not even them. And if they say they are, they're not telling you the truth. So if you've been listening to my shows from season one, I frequently talk about how I did not have a great role model in the kitchen for me to learn from. My mom did not cook or bake, and when she did make an attempt, the food, well, for lack of a better word, inedible. It was inedible. Not even close. And I love her. I love her. I love you, mom. Love you, mom. You're a good woman, mom. Not a great cook or baker. The stories I could tell you would curl your hair and then straighten it. But we digress. So I started baking and experimenting in the kitchen when I was quite young and not on an easy bake oven. I went rogue. Oh, yeah. I did everything on my own. It truly is scary that I never burnt the house down. And I never had the proper equipment, so I ad-libbed. Put it this way, I was the first MacGyver before there ever was one. I was ahead of my time. Let me tell you about one of my first big-time mistakes that did not go over well. My mom received a cookbook as a gift when I was about 10 or 11 years old, And there was a beautiful picture of a chocolate cheesecake in there. I ogled over that gorgeous thing for weeks. I just had to make it. I was dreaming about it. I reread the recipe about 50 million times. So when my parents invited my maternal grandparents over for dinner, I pounced. And I said, Mom, Mom, I'm going to make the dessert, okay? Can I make the dessert? And my mom Being who she was, never looked a gift horse in the mouth, and she said, you want to make the dessert? Go for it. Just just do it. So my mom purchased me the ingredients, and of course, there was like pounds of of cream cheese in that recipe. No problem, right? Well, I had never made a cheesecake before. I had no electric mixer. I had no handheld mixer. Very bad omens, don't you think? So by hand, in a bowl and a wooden spoon, I old schooled it and I creamed the cold cream cheese, notice the emphasis on the word cold, with the sugar, mashing them against the sides of the bowl until my arms couldn't do it anymore. Needless to say, the custard of the cheesecake, because cheesecake is a custard, was a bit lumpy, more than a bit lumpy. Clumpy, lumpy, uh, whatever you want to call it. It was ugly. And there was chocolate in there too. So a lot of things happening in that batter. And I had no control over it. I baked it in the chocolate cookie crust, served it the next day. And I chilled it all night in the fridge. Oh boy. As my great Aunt Anna would have said, Oy vey! So I I cut it after dinner. I proudly served a slice to each of my grandparents. My grandfather was sitting next to my grandmother. And let me give you a visual. It was a chocolate cheesecake on the outside with white lumps throughout the cheesecake. Okay, got a picture? And I don't mean perfectly placed like polka dots. I mean just helter-skelter clumps, waiting for the oohs and ahs from my grandparents 
all I heard from my grandfather as he loudly whispered to my grandmother was, what are the white lumps? I was mortified. Oh my, oh my goodness. Oh my gracious. Oh my God. I wanted to melt into the floor and never come out. So I learned a lot of things. And how did this experience make me a better baker? Well, first I learned that you really do need to let the cold cream cheese get to room temperature, all right? When making a cheesecake batter, you must bring cream cheese to room temperature. And second, you need a mixer, a handheld or an electric one. This is imperative to getting the smoothest cheesecake custard And don't forget to stop the mixer frequently to scrape down the sides of the bowl and the paddle. Those tricks I've learned over the years to making the smoothest cheesecake. But I'll tell you, I always have a flashback to that ominously lumpy, clumpy chocolate cheesecake. But I learned such a great life lesson there, and it was hard But you know what? I never made the same mistake twice. All right. My next most memorable mishap happened when my daughter turned five and I made her a birthday cake, a Tyrannosaurus Rex cake. She loved dinosaurs back then and she still does. So I found this really cute T-Rex mold and I made a yellow cake batter using the creaming method of mixing. And this is where bad things started happening. I was in a rush. I don't know why that day I was in a rush. I I don't know what happened. And I was blending the softened butter and sugar. And I thought, okay, okay, 10 seconds is good. And creaming is done. So I proceeded to the next step, which is typical in the creaming method of mixing. You add your eggs one at a time. I started adding my eggs one at a time. And the batter looked a little little funky, a little broken, a little thin. But I kept on going. I figured it will all come together. And finally, I added the dry ingredients alternately with the wet ingredients. But the batter wasn't really emulsifying. It wasn't emulsified at all. It was pretty thin. I poured it into the pan and baked it because I was in a rush. I just needed to bake this thing. I had to frost it. I had to decorate. There was so many things to do, right? My five-year-old's birthday party. Oh boy, oh boy, I took it out of the oven. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It looked as flat as a real T-Rex being excavated in Utah. Flat as a board, ready for the paleontologist to come out with his brush. Oh, I was, I was so upset. I mean, what the heck did I do? So I rehashed every single thing in my brain. I went through the recipe. I made sure I didn't miss anything. Did I miss an ingredient? No. I, I, over and over in my head, what did I do? Then I took a deep breath. And I took a beat. And I realized I can't use this cake. I can't use this cake. I can't frost this cake. I, I'd have to make three or four of them. They're so thin. And I had just started culinary school. I had a reputation to uphold. I can't serve this thing. So I took the cake out of the sheet. Well, if you call it a cake, I took the cake out of the sheet pan, out of the pan, flipped it into a bowl, and it suddenly dawned on me what I had done wrong. It wasn't the ingredients. I put everything in right. The butter was at room temperature. Everything was fine. But you know what the creaming method is, right? You use the paddle attachment to blend softened butter and granulated sugar in your electric mixer until the mixture gets light and fluffy. Light and fluffy. Well, I never had reached light nor fluffy. Not even close. I was in too much of a rush. So why would it matter so much? Why did it make a difference? What does reaching light and fluffy mean anyway? Well, it's more important than you think. Don't take anything for granted in baking. So air is forced into the butter. As you reach light and fluffy, the butter 
Remember, butter's originally yellow in color. It actually turns white because it's being aerated. Air is being forced into it. And that's a good thing. As the creaming process proceeds, there are chemical leaveners in the cake batter that you will add, right? And they create carbon dioxide gas bubbles. And these gas bubbles will seek out these air bubbles in the fat, making them even larger. And the combination of bubbles, air bubbles, and carbon dioxide gas bubbles from the leavening agent helps that cake to rise, forming its light texture and that beautiful structure inside. Insufficient creaming results in a low volume cake that is heavy and dense. And that is just what I got, heavy and dense. I was guilty. I was guilty of insufficient creaming. Oh my gosh. So I made it again. Don't ever rush the creaming process. So I actually did the whole thing all over again, this time creaming for several minutes until I saw light and fluffy. And you know what? What a difference creaming long enough made. The second cake I made, I swear I'm not exaggerating, it was almost four inches higher. Who knew the power of creaming made such a difference? It really does. Another baking mistake I made was when I was making pizza with my young daughter years ago. I had made a pizza dough and allowed it to rise. I had always cut a small piece so that she could make her own individual pizza. She loved doing this. This was like a full afternoon activity for me and for her and for us. And we always had so much fun. This time was a little different. I gave her a piece of dough. And as I formed one large pizza for the rest of the family, spreading the dough with sauce and cheese and peppers and olive oil, she was still working her dough. She was patting it out and then saying, well, I'll do it again. Patting it out, then rolling it up, then patting it out. Oh boy, oh boy. After an hour, after one hour, this kid is patting out her dough and making a pizza crust. After an so many things she was doing with this dough. And she had kept resisting my urging her to get her pizza finished. I thought she was having fun, right? I'm a mom. I saw fun, no tears. Let her do it. I had never seen a dough get so tight in my life. And sometimes overworking a yeast dough can create too much gluten. But yikes, oh my goodness. This was the tightest of rubber bands of gluten that I had ever seen. This kid with her great attention span, which I used to brag to people about, just kept working her dough into oblivion. And then it happened. The thing that I had only read about in bread baking books, the gluten broke. The small piece of lovely dough turned literally to Swiss cheese. It became lax and full of holes. It actually was as if the dough had given up. It had succumbed to my young daughter's pummeling. I actually had never seen this before, the breaking of gluten strands. It was was disturbing in so many ways. Not only was I seeing a phenomenon that I had only read about, now I was terrified about how I was going to let my kid know she would have no tiny pizza for dinner. I told her it was time to put the sauce and the cheese on her pizza 45 minutes ago, but she was having so much fun, I let her have at it. Wow. Okay, if I forced the issue, there would have been a flood of tears, and now, what do I do? How do I tell her her dough has actually been through a war of her own making, and there would be no individual pizza tonight? All right, I took a breath, and I decided to try a Hail Mary. I told her the dough needed to be covered and given a break while I thought about what to do. I gathered that poor, miserable piece of dough back together, and I allowed it a short rest. I covered it with a kitchen cloth. I gave it a very 
small 15-minute, sort of a rest in peace siesta, if you will, because I know gluten, if allowed to rest, will relax a bit. Well, she bought my story, and after about 15 minutes, I peeked under the kitchen towel I had placed over it. It wasn't that relaxed, but I knew I could salvage it, and she would, in fact, get her little pizza tonight. We quickly covered it with sauce, no more playing with the dough, cheese, and into the oven it went with my apologies, and the apologies were not to my daughter. They were to the dough. What I learned was not to overhandle any yeast spread. Any yeast dough over kneading will cause more gluten to develop, making it harder to shape. And then once you pass a certain point, the point of no return, the gluten snaps like a rubber band, breaking its protein matrix. To this day, that life lesson has stayed with me. I never overhandle yeastos. And I tell my students never to overhandle yeastos. It's very important and it works every time because the yeasto will turn into a beautiful yeasted bread. So the reason I shared some of these baking stories, baking mistakes or horrors, if you will, is because you should learn from all your mistakes, baking or otherwise. The one lesson I always teach my students is you will always make mistakes, always, as long as you are alive. It's part of being human, but the key takeaway is never make the same mistake twice. Learn from it. And that's why I've confided in you with all of my baking mistakes. This concludes season two of Baking Radio I hope you've had as much fun as I have, and I hope you will join me for season three for some conversations on baking. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, my YouTube channel, and my website, chefgailsokol.com.